Um, and I just want to introduce myself again. So my name is Hillary Kane, and I'm a member of the Coordinated Campaign Committee, which is the committee at the national level in the Green Party that supports and promotes candidates and campaigns. And one of the things that we do is provide a regular campaign training through this monthly series of webinars and conference calls. So, um, so we are excited to be able to tonight focus on fundraising, since that is a huge need within the party and sort of a perennial need of all Green Party candidates um, is to really get more sophisticated and, um, you know, build our bench in terms of, you know, fundraising so that we can actually get the word out and do what we want to do. Uh, so before we turn it over to our presenters, why don't we try to go around the room, um, you know, and I usually try to do it geographically, so like, you know, southwest to northeast, so to speak, um, and just feel free to introduce yourself, who you are. If you're a candidate, of course, please tell us that information. Um, and, you know, and that's just that keep it brief and we will move on. So feel free to, we'll kind of self-identify and... So let's try to move from the, the southwest to the northeast. So no southwest folks, maybe northwest or the mountain states. All right, anyone in the central time zone? Yeah, Hi, Hillary. Great. Okay, good. So everyone on this call is from the east? Yeah, we're all um, you. Iowa City is here. Yeah, it's Holly Hart. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, central time zone, yeah, like, let's kick it off. So, so Holly, you're here from Iowa. That's great. Anyone else around Iowa? It broadly defined. Anything else along the Mississippi River? Okay. So, anything else in the Central Time Zone at all before we move to the east? Okay. Well, then we'll just start from Florida and go on up. Anyone from from Florida? Moving further north, the rest of the South, the Mid Atlantic. Well, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> So and I, you know, I'll consider that Mid-Atlantic. No Maryland out there? This is the most bizarre uh, Northeast uh, call that we've ever had. So that's great. I mean, it's fine. Um, hello. Yeah, can you hear yes, me? Hello. Yes. Hi, this is Brian. I'm from Maryland. Yay. Hey, Brian. Um, anyone else? And hi, from? Yeah, this is Kim, and I'm from New Jersey. Okay, great. Sorry, who was that from New Jersey? Um, it's Kim from New Jersey. I'm right across oh, hey, the Kim. from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How you doing? Good to, good to hear, hear your voice. All right. Anything else? Everyone else is from New York and North, it sounds like. Um, did we miss anybody south of Pennsylvania, New Jersey? Adam in Indiana. Indiana. Okay, great. I see, You know, that's right. You guys are not in the central time zone. You are part of the east. Um, so welcome, Indiana. Um any, anywhere else in what I would call the Midwest, even though it's not, you know, maybe Ohio, Michigan. Aaron, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Hi, folks. The Great Lakes on. area. I'm also awesome. All right. And then before we move to the to the Northeast and to New England, is there anyone else I'm missing? Oh, I'm in Indiana, too. My name is Michael. Thank you. All right. And then let's take it away, New York and, and above. I'm Cassandra Lamps from Long Island, uh, Nassau County. I'm running for town council in the town of North Hempstead. And I recognize other people from New York. <laughs> Gloria Matera from New York, um, a fellow steering committee member uh, with Hillary and the liaison for the CCC. Carol Sandy Presbleck, Erie County, New York. That's in western New York. I'm running for town council in Chichawaga. Michael O'Neill, Syracuse, New York. I'm a member of the Green Party National Committee, and I'm a member of the Fundraising Committee of the Green Party of New York. Anyone else in New York or otherwise in the New England? All right. So is there anyone else that I missed? Anyone else who did not get a chance to introduce themselves? Maybe we just have a lot of workers who don't want to... Say hello tonight, which is fine. Um, and then, of course, we have our um, our presenters who also hail from all over the place. And so, um, I will let them do the bulk of introducing themselves and their expertise. But we have with us 
Susan Sutton, who is the principal of Sutton and Associates um, and happens to be the um, fundraising consultant that the Green Party has engaged with over the past year or so to try to, you know, really um, get better at, with our own fundraising operation as a party. Um, and her colleague and associate Jennifer Scher, who has done a lot of the actual work on our project. So I'm very pleased to have them both be um, on the call uh, and sharing some of their expertise. Um, we might chime in to give a little more, you know, sort of Green Party political context for, you know, some of the, the things they're going to say, but for the most part, I want to, you know, give them the floor. Um, and um, I'm trying to just make sure this PowerPoint kind of lines up well on my screen, and I'm going to share screen in a minute. And so I think without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Susan and um, Jennifer, and we will let them sort of floor and have hopefully a really robust discussion. So Susan, do you want to get, get us started? It looks like in the top center there's a box that says 86.3. Maybe yeah, if you change better. that to 100. Well, that's better. All right. Okay, great. Great. Uh, well, so this is Susan speaking, and um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. It's been an incredible experience for us to work over the last year with the Green Party and um, with my colleague Jennifer, who, who actually she just texted me. She's not able to uh, actually log on to the um, the site, but she's dialed in so she can hear. So we'll have to walk uh, through the presentation when it gets to her piece, uh, kind of page by page. But, but basically what we did was we put together uh, a presentation that starts at a very high level, very conceptual level, dealing with some concepts that I think are really important to help inform how you think about um, how, how to um, interface with your constituents. And then Jennifer will talk more about the nuts and bolts that that, um, if we could just go to the first page, Hillary. So what I want to start with is a discussion around what I call the trifecta. And it's, it's really the, the combination of three very contemporary concepts, uh, new, new power, next generation enterprise, and blitz scaling. Together, I believe that they bring age of opportunity to everyone, and they democratize philanthropy. So basically, when you combine these three concepts, the trifecta, they help inform fundraising strategy, constituent mobilization, resource allocation, strategic uh, planning and campaign planning, how contributions are made, and how success is achieved. Overall, um, when you combine these concepts, you will maximize your impact and, and the impact that you have on the world. Essentially, this trifecta has uh, you know, allowed us to enter a new dimension in terms of how we conduct ourselves in the political arena. Next slide, please. Sorry, did we lose Susan? No, I'm here. I, uh, oh. Could we have the next slide, please? Sorry, I couldn't, I didn't hear that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think somehow my audio just, I lost. Yeah. There you go. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between old power and new power. Old power, um, as you know, uh, is held by a few jealously guarded, well-stocked, closed, inaccessible, and leader-driven. But we're experiencing a really transformational shift in the world to new power, made by many, open, participatory, and peer-driven. The shift is on a continuum, but it's picking up pace, and it's virtually influencing and informing uh, every aspect of our contemporary lives. Next slide, please, Hillary. So next generation enterprise uh, is informed by the new power paradigm. Uh, customers are looking for opportunities to be engaged, participate, and solve life events. As an example of this from the private sector, Staples' tagline is work, learn, and grow. Uh, to be successful, a next generation enterprise must move to a knowledge-based information economy. This is not just a digital model, but it's really based on knowledge and information and experience and participation, all informed by the new power paradigm. So um, an example that I wanted to just touch on is Weight Watchers, which has been looking at how preferences are changing and their perspectives on what a great experience is and how they are interfacing with technology and expectations for personalization. Their new strategy includes introducing online social media community groups, audio, music, and meditation content, and workouts to its app 
they personalize ratings, and they provide rewards for healthy choices. So clearly the private sector is, is engaged in this, this new paradigm. There are a couple of opportunities for us to look at nonprofit as well as the political arena, which we'll touch on later. But let me go next to blitzscaling. So next slide, Hillary. So blitzscaling is a term coined by Reid Hoffman, who uh, wrote a book, Blitzscaling. And uh, it really talks about practices for igniting and managing dizzying growth. It prioritizes speed over efficiency, and it allows organizations, enterprises to go from startup to scale up, scale up at a very furious pace. But at the heart of blitzscaling are two uh, principles, the network effect and distribution models. Next slide, Hillary. So when you when you harness new power, next generation enterprise, and blitz scaling, you can have tremendous social effect and the distribution model um, to a T. So next slide, Hillary. Leveraging their infrastructure and staffing limitations. They did this by partnering with organizations serving the same clients in exchange for years. Next slide, Hillary. This network effect allowed DFS to scale the number of people it served without costing a dime. They also leveraged a very innovative distribution model. They invited anyone who wanted to start a DFS shop to New York uh, to train and quote unquote sleep on their futons so they could return to their hometown to start the new DFS shops. Next slide, Hillary. The Obama campaign also use the trifecta. And we see it now being amplified by the Sanders campaign and other progressive campaigns. Next slide. So what you see as a result of this trifecta is that the barriers to entry are lower and the Green Party now has a new opportunity. But going back to the Obama campaign, in 2008 they used connectivity and technology and existing networks and a powerful distribution to achieve their goals. Next slide. Their focus was on small donations from individuals via internet. Uh, as a result, they raised more than any previous candidate, $650 million. Half of that was from donations of less than $200. In contrast, 27% of the money during the raise during the 2004 campaign came from low dollar donors. So it's the momentum that you want to look at here and what this trifecta enabled them to accomplish. Next slide, please. They also utilized technology. There were three key tools. My Barack Obama, which was a social network uh, that leveraged existing networks of supporters uh, so that they could connect with one another as well as create groups, plan events, and raise funds. Next slide, please. The second tool was Neighbor to Neighbor, a canvassing tool. Using digital technology, they matched up their volunteers with people that they would likely connect with. Uh, this generated 8 million calls and tremendous word of mouth. Next slide, please. The third uh, technical tool they used was uh, Vote for Change, a voter registration site. They helped uh, 1 million voters register, and ultimately Obama received 69 million votes, a record for any U.S. presidential candidate. Next slide, please. So the Green Party fundraising efforts can deploy the principles of the trifecta, and it will have an impact on your strategy, your constituent mobilization, allocation of resources, and key outcomes and deliverables that are identified in the, in the GPUS case for support, which I want to touch on briefly. Next slide, please. So as we all know, all of our constituents have various ways of, of contributing. They have work, they have wealth, they have wisdom, and ultimately people will engage in whatever way makes sense for them, and in whatever way you enable them to get to uh, contribute. The, the GPUS funding priorities help uh, donors figure out how they want to invest by characterizing the desired outcomes. They explain why the funds need to be raised and interwoven in their tactics are the principles of the trifecta. Next slide, please. So the case for support has five basic funding priorities. Increase membership and diversity, run and elect more candidates, create more positive awareness of the party, create closer ties with movements, more effective issue advocacy, policy development, and change structures to better align with the goals. So you can see where the tri trifecta is interwoven in these goals. Next slide, please. So keeping the principles of the trifecta in mind, 
it's important that you articulate your funding priorities. You price those priorities so that constituents can understand how every dollar makes a difference, and you create opportunity for those wishing to support your campaign with their work, wealth, and wisdom, every opportunity to do so. So really, in summary, for my portion of this, this presentation, I just want to point out that today's constituents, they want to interface with technology, they want a great experience, and they have uh, great expectations of personalization. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer Schneer, my colleague, who will talk about some of the tactics around uh, fundraising in the political arena. Next slide, please. Thank you, Susan. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful, great. thank you. Okay, so um, thanks so much uh, to Next everyone. Slide, for joining. Sorry? Uh, Jennifer, we're on uh, page 20 now. Oh, it's okay, I, I'm, I can see it now. Okay. And I'll let Hillary know when to change the slide. Okay. Thank you. So today, um, now that we've kind of talked about the the why and what the, what's happening in the marketplace, we wanted to actually provide you with some ideas, some resources, and tactical solutions to help you fundraise successfully. So to start getting some of those um, thoughts um, in your mind as you hit the campaign trail. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. I do uh, want to say if anybody does have a question, please um, feel free to ask it. And I know Hillary and, uh, will jump in whenever she wants to add additional comments. Um, but first we wanted to talk about, so you're going to be thinking about fundraising, you're going to be thinking about bringing that money in at all times. But um, while you're thinking about fundraising and starting some of the fundraising tactics, these are, uh, we wanted to flag some of the things you should be thinking about if you haven't already. So obviously the first one is um, defining your platform and your message. Once you've crystallized that, everything, all of your communications will flow from that and be sort of a cohesive message. From there, you'll want to develop campaign materials, whether that's um, your posters um, or emails. So just having um, your collateral, your brand, your, your look and your feel. Um, you'll probably want to craft a preliminary campaign finance budget to know what, you're, what you need to raise money for and how you're going to spend that money. Um, you will want to identify and staff your volunteer committees. And of course, you, want, you probably have you know, Excel spreadsheets um, or even you know, printed out lists on Word documents for your supporters and all of your donors. Um, you'll want to consolidate and sort of organize all of that data so you have that at the ready when you're ready to hit the ground running for your fundraising. And then last but not least, um, you want to make sure you understand um, and review all of the campaign finance laws. You know, this can be very tricky and you don't want to get into any situations where you've accept, accepted donations that aren't allowed. And you would know, uh, and you will know best. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, in order to fundraise, you will need to have the logistics behind you in order to collect those donations. So you'll want to collect donations digitally, so that means an online platform. And then that same online platform can help you collect donations when you're calling donors or donors mail in um, a pledge form with their credit card information. So you'll need, and um, so yeah, you'll need to have something that your volunteers and yourself can input that data into and have a database where it collects it. So we've, looked at a few options. Um, we know that there's um, Democracy Engine. I don't have the costing on that, um, but it is one that's used throughout the political sphere. PayPal is a really um, basic one. It can allow you to actually set up a, a front-facing donation form where you, you embed that in your website. Um, and it has one of the lowest rates in the industry in terms of processing fees. No matter, I should flag that, no matter what um, you're doing, they will, you will always have a processing fee. So there's no such thing as a free, a free platform. Um, there's Stripe and what's called IATS. So those are four different um, options that you can use. You may have, know of others. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but these are ones that we've used, have experience with, um, and can recommend. Uh, next slide, please. 
when you're starting to work on your data files and looking at all your donors and your supporters, you'll want to try to do some basic supporter segmentation because this will be important for when you're targeting individuals for asks um, in the future. So we've recommended some very simple buckets for targeting. So you'll want to pull out all of your lo loyal donors first. So you can sort by lifetime giving. Um, you can look at people who have given to you in the last two years or depending on how long you've been um, a candidate for, you can go back further. So having your, lo your loyal donors are going to be who you're going to ask for money from first um, and you're going to want to make sure you're stewarding those donors, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and so they've given more than once. And then the second one is single gift donors. So people who have given to you once, these might they might have just given you know twenty dollars at an event, so they might be a little less um, committed to you and your um, platform, but there's still an opportunity to convert them into a loyal donor. Then you might have people who have attended um, an event, so you have their names from a ticket, either a purchase or a giveaway, um, and, or maybe you did an email draw. So these people haven't given, but they're still going to be important um, as a targeting segment because you will want to ask them for money because they have um, created, they have taken an action with you. So they have um, they have come to an event, so they show some interest in what you're doing. Of course, you'll want to have a list of your volunteers and then anyone else who might be in your file. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we wanted to talk about some of the actual tactics you could use to start your fundraising off. And here we've highlighted five, and we'll go into a little bit more detail of these five. So um, in general, we ask for money on the phone. We'll ask through it through email, um, in person, which will be a really important one to get um, to sort of the higher level donors, um, through social media, and then um, through crowdfunding. So I'll go through each of these in detail. Next slide, please. So um, first, we're going to talk about in-person because this is going to be um, the ask that's, these are your biggest asks. These You're going to be targeting your top donors and your top pres prospects from your segmentation exercise. So, you know, in addition to knowing who your loyal donors are and how much they've given to you over the years, um, you may also have names that have come through through you know you know I know this great businessman in the community who wants to support um, a political campaign we think he'd be a great fit so these are called your prospects and you'll want to make sure you have a nice robust list of those as well um, ideally it's the can um, it's the candidates themselves that are going to be doing the one-to-one -one interaction so targeting them with a personal call or an email um, with the end goal to actually book an in-person meeting. So to enhance your um, new donor prospect list, you'll want to look at your network. So using your friends and families to recommend names um, of individuals in your community. Um, LinkedIn is actually a great tool for prospecting as well. So um, look at who your second well, first, your first connection, but your second connection. So who do you know um, that might be connected to an influential or um, affluent individual in your community? Uh, and then try to see if your first connection will make an introduction to that second connection. So um, that is a great way to, to prospect and try to find and expand your network of um, individual donors. Next slide. Uh, so, um, you'll have your, um, so your, your bigger gift prospects will absolutely should be done by your candidate, but there's also an opportunity for phone calls to happen at a lower level for um, staff or friends and family who are helping you out um, to pick up the phone and start calling some of the people who might have made those lower value gifts. So the $15 and $20, $30 donors, um, pick up the phone and just have a basic script prepared for them and um, ask them for money to ask them to renew their support. And then you'll be able to, because you've already set up your online donation 
um, platform, they'll be able to process the um, gift directly on the phone. What you don't want to do is leave them to say, sure, sure, I'll send it in the mail. So whatever um, you want to try to lock in the gift on the phone if possible. Of course, you'll always have some of the older generation that don't feel comfortable with that or don't have a credit card to do that. So you may need to send them out a donor package. But the best case scenario is to um, process it over the phone. Uh, next one, please. Email, of course, is a very cost-effective way um, and an easy way to reach as many people as possible. So the first step is obviously to try to collect as many email addresses. So whenever, wherever you are campaigning um, and wherever you're having an event, wherever you're asking for um, any information, um, you'll want to collect that email address. And you're going to want to make sure that people are opting in to receiving communications. So that's another little thing, just making sure you're abiding by email contact law. Um, then you can actually set up a free account on um, a platform called MailChimp. So this is an email deployment tool. So as long as you have less than 2,000 records, you can send emails out for free. Um, it's really easy to use because it's all, you know, just upload an image, drag and drop, um, just type in the text where you need it. It won't be, it'll be, you know, basic, but, um, and if you have support, maybe one of your volunteers can actually do a bit of um, coding, then that makes it even better, but um, most people can use it because it's actually pretty simple. Um, and then you can also, I know Hillary, um, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about nation builder um, and what communications you can actually support. So if there's any text or email, um, like how would they get a hold of that? Sure. So, um, you know, it may be appropriate for your campaign, depending on the issue, to sort of either pull from, you know, press releases that we've sent out or, you know, email appeals that we've sent out from the national level in terms of you know, you could take something, a statement that we put out about a national issue and then sort of customize it and personalize it for your local context. Um, in terms of the mechanics of sending out emails, you know, we're not really set up to do that for campaigns, but we, based on the call we had, I think two weeks ago, um, we were having some pretty interesting conversation about more that we could do to provide this type of service and other, you know, web, web tools for candidates. So I think um, at this point, we can't provide an email communication platform directly for you, but we can certainly recommend, you know, Nation Builder is one. Um, you know, the other we were talking about two weeks ago was Civi CRM. Um, there's a couple things out there um, that we can certainly, you know, basically provide free consultation and advice on um, and that sort of thing. Great. Thank you, Hillary. Okay, so next slide. So the other great tool that political parties have at their disposal, um, which is also free, um, is your social media accounts. So this is where you have the opportunity to actively engage um, and with your supporters by sharing unique content, um, videos that you're developing. Um, it's it's easy just to do a quick 30 minute up or 30 seconds, 30 minute, 30 second update um, and send that out to your Twitter and your Facebook followers. Um, it obviously should completely focus on your campaign and your platform, but once you've got your following and once you've built up a nice stream of content, you can embed, you can start um, including fundraising asks um, minimally, so you don't want to make it more than 5 to 10 percent of the communications that are going out, um, but you can start to incorporate that. Um, and Facebook is the best platform for that because it allows you a little bit more um, flexibility in the amount of text you can use and the images, et cetera. Um, if you actually um, have been fundraising successfully and you have extra money, you can actually test targeted Facebook ads. So this is also really easy to use. So um, once you set up your Facebook page, um, you can actually go through that and target by location. You can actually target by anyone who doesn't express an interest in climate change or Green Party or 
whatever um, whatever interests that might come to you. So it's a really sophisticated tool, um, and it's available for do, and you can do very small amounts of money if you want to do that. Um, and the fifth thing we wanted to talk about um, is crowdfunding. So everyone will probably have experienced some sort of crowdfunding ask um, at some point in the last five to ten years. Um, these are those platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, GoFundMe. So those are the sort of the mainstream ones, and they each have different strengths and what they're um, and what they're uh, raising money for. But essentially, it's um, you're setting a campaign target, so you're setting in a value amount, and um, the one that, and then you're inviting people to visit that special page that you set up on the platform, and asking them to donate through there. So, and you can share, it's, um, they're pretty turnkey, and um, they're really great if you have a very, um, a shorter campaign cycle, and you set a specific camp campaign goal. I've just put a screen grab of one, that, a random one that we found online, um, but that's just to showcase, it's not a political uh, affiliation of any kind, but it's just to showcase what it would look like. Um, this is from the platform called Fundly, uh, which is, it has um, support specifically for political campaigns. So you can set up a campaign fundraising page for free, and it just charges you a fee from the gift rate. So it's really great if you don't have the resources to set up your own website, um, and it, you, you also don't have to set up another online donation platform because it could all go through there. You just need to be digitally pushing that out to your supporters, and maybe you're doing that through Facebook, um, through your social channels, and through your email. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, of course, we know that um, there are still other ways to fundraise, of course, um, and we just wanted to flag two of them. Uh, the first is events. So, you know, events will have a time and a place in your fundraising campaign, but you want to be strategic. You want to make sure you're evaluating the cost-benefit um, ratio before diving in. Sometimes events can suck up a lot of time, um, and while it can be good, and you may have other objectives in terms of um, getting your message out and engaging supporters, um, if it's a fundraising event, you need to make sure that um, you're, you're going to be able to raise the money um, successfully and have a positive uh, ROI. So you should definitely... Um, do cultivation events. So these are more intimate events where you're inviting your top donors to build a relationship, so you're networking with them, um, you're allowing them the opportunity to talk with you one-on-one -on -one and um, start creating that relationship. Um, you want to do stewardship events, so now you'll hopefully have some donors on board and you want to bring them in, maybe it's twice a year uh, or quarterly, but you want to say thank you to them um, and to your volunteers as well. And um, it's a great opportunity to keep the conversation open about what you're doing and how you're moving forward with your campaign. And then last but not least, you should definitely consider third-party events. So this is where you're putting it in the hands of your supporters. So people who are your most loyal supporters, they'll want to help you raise money. So they can do the bake sales, they can run the garage sale on their street. So those things um, where the money is raised in your name are great because you're pretty hands off and then you just collect the funds afterwards. Okay, next one. Um, we also just wanted to flag direct mail. So um, if you do have a little bit of excess budget, you can, it still works. So mail can still be effective um, in terms of fundraising. So as long as you can pay for printing and postage um, and you have the volunteers to help you stuff envelopes, it can be a great way to raise money. So um, you have your peers at the national um, office. So Hillary and team can hopefully share some exa examples of the direct mail that's worked for them at a national level. Um, and maybe you just build on that. And then always make sure you have a donation form included. So you can 
um, easily develop one yourself. Um, just I just use Canva. I've done it for the charities that I've worked for in the past. Um, and you can just whip something up and make sure that's printed and included um, with an address on which on how to mail that back. So that's the most important thing. Okay, next slide, please. And then when all is said and done, um, and you've raised lots and lots of money, you're going to want to make sure you've properly welcomed your don donors into the fold, and you want to have thanked your donors with, you know, and timing is everything. You want to make sure you thank them quickly. So when a donor comes in, you don't want to wait more than a week or two to welcome them and to thank them um, after they've given. Um, it's you know, handwritten thank you notes are an amazing way to thank donors who are giving at a certain level. So maybe that's $250 and up or whatever threshold you decide. Um, but it's a really meaningful way and donors really appreciate that. You can send out video messages to everyone by email. Um, you'll want to organize regular webinars and invite everyone on your list, on your email list, to listen to what's going on, what's new with your campaign. Um, you, if you have the resources, uh, providing an impact statement about how their gift has supported you. So this can be, you know, a one-page newsletter, um, either digitally or in paper. And then, you know, it's also great to acknowledge donors on a digital donor wall. So um, if you have a website to put here are our donors, um, you know, signify dollar value, or um, if you have a campaign headquarters. Um, a physical donor wall is also a great way. And then taking pictures of that donor wall and pushing that out to social is a great way to honor people who can't get up into the headquarters. So um, that is, so I wanted to turn it over to anyone for questions for either Susan or I. Great, thank you so much. Um, there were a couple people I muted because of background noise. I'm going to take you off of muting unless there's still noise. So if you want to ask a question when you're not hearing yourself. So I know for some of you this is probably not new information, and for others of you this is very new. But, um, you know, we you certainly did. love to hear you know, what people's experiences are. If every, I mean, we certainly have expertise around the room in terms of, you know, many of you have been on campaigns and have done fundraising um, some more successfully than others. But, you know, let's, let's open up a discussion. You did. Uh, this is Chris Richardson calling from Sac Sacramento. Great. Welcome. Ah, thank you. I uh, wasn't sure whether you were hearing me. Um, but uh, th this is uh, a lot of very good information. Uh, would, I've been doing some uh, quick searches <laughs> as, as the information came by. Um, and uh, I would like to get a copy of the slides. Um, do we have an address Not where we can get, get that, get those? Um, I can forward, since I have your email now, I can certainly forward that out. And the other thing that we'll do, um, the call is being recorded, number one. Um, and the recording oh, very good. plus the slide deck will go up on the gpus.org website. So that's our more internal facing. So not gp.org, okay. but gpus.org under the Coordinated Campaign Committee site. Okay. And I'll put that in the chat box as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hi, this is Michael O'Neill. Does anybody want to talk about uh, some of their actual successes and or struggles with fundraising? I mean, I know there are struggles out there. We did a survey of candidates um, from the November last year. So in November, December, we surveyed um, 150 candidates, and we got about 50 responses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, interestingly, fundraising kind of ran the gamut. Um, so we had, um, you know, folks who raised over $10,000, and then we had a lot of folks who raised, you know, zero, less than 1000 and some people specifically raised, like, almost no money. And for some, it seemed like that was a point of pride, 
as if there was something you you know unique and special about Green Party campaigns where you know because we want money out of politics that means we want all money you know every single dollar um, out of politics. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of hangups sometimes in the party about money and asking people for money and, you know, not wanting it to, of course, drive what we're doing, but, you know, recognizing that it's necessary to, you know, do a lot of the work that we want to do. So, um, so I'll just, I'll put that out there as a conversation prompt. And then more, you know, um, pragmatically, Sandy is asking, has anyone um, else had difficulty with Facebook ads and boosting Facebook posts? Michael O'Neill Stack. Yeah, Mike. Um, regarding Facebook ads and Facebook posts, I mean, the initial hurdle is getting yourself verified as you, know, you have to send in a copy of like your driver's license and because posts 2016, they're you know they're very strict about verifying identities before they allow people to run political ads, and then you have to make sure that you're giving enough time for your ad to get approved um, for each individual ad, assuming that you have been that you've gone through the approval process. So, Sandy, if I mean you know there could be a either a webinar or a screen recording just about walking people through that process. Because um, when you're up against campaign deadlines, it can be pretty nerve-wracking. Um, speaking to some of the other points, um, I wanted to recommend that people take a look at a service called HubSpot, H-U-B as in boy, S-P-O-T. Um, it's a free CRM, and it has integrations with MailChimp, so, um, and, and it you know, might have integrations with uh, some of the other fundraising services. Uh, so I see that Sandy is saying that her Facebook uh, account for ads was never approved. The system bots keep rejecting her ID. So Sandy, maybe that's something I can, I can follow up with you here in New York State, and we can share with other folks what solution we find. Um, in, uh, and then another point just regarding the whole presentation is uh, it's great that the presenters, I, I thank them very much for for presenting how your – you're working with people on a like a a funnel or a, a you can think of it like a conveyor belt of like when people come in as prospects uh, versus you know when they're maybe making their initial donation versus as you're trying to move them into uh, bigger contributions over the course of your campaign and then of course as you're you're thanking them at different points along the line and, and certainly thanking them uh, by or before the end of your campaign and so it really comes down to planning. And having and, and trying to envision like what does that assembly line look like for your campaign manager or your volunteers who are helping out with your campaign um, because it, as especially in the middle of, a, of an electoral campaign all these different steps and thinking about okay who are the prospects I'm going to recruit for an event and you know who's going to receive my direct mail um, if you're all trying to figure it out as you go along it can be very overwhelming. And so uh, trying to at least foresee some of what the steps along that, that funnel or that, that conveyor belt is going to be is important and at least setting some goals for yourself. Um, and then uh, I am curious eventually about within our party exploring the difference between fundraising in the context of a campaign and fundraising for our more longer term party organs like our state parties, like our national party, because um, I feel like those have different dynamics and um, and we need both. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry, that's a lot. Uh, I hope it's not too much to give at once. And uh, thanks everyone for the presentation. Over. No, thanks Mike. That was good, helpful information, particularly about Facebook. and. Um, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it does require planning, and yet in the moment, you know, campaigning is so hectic and frenetic mm -hmm. when you're, you know, doing it right. And, you know, there's so much going on, and you can't keep track of it all. But, um, I mean, I think one answer with the sort of how does the party interface with the campaign, you know, to some degree, at least this is drawing from my own experience, that, you know, one informs the other. So to some degree... Now, I probably first came in through the door on a campaign, 
but then whatever I learned on that campaign, I tried to then plow into the party the next year and then learn some more things during the party building and then plowed that into the next campaign, you know, et cetera. So, you know, hopefully folks see this as kind of like this iterative process where we're kind of constantly learning and hopefully getting better each time. Um, but I would say in my experience, running, you know, fundraising around a campaign can be way more successful than the party because, can, you know, campaigns are exciting. You know, there's a person who, who represents this, you know, thing, and there's this sense of urgency, right? It's November 5th or 7th or whatever the election day is this year. You know, it's, it's like literally a race to the finish line, and that tends to get people motivated, and, you know, you can sort of get people to like, you know, we've got to get this ad out, you know, tonight in order to be on, you know, like you can sort of create these like, you know, senses of urgency that, you can also do in the party, but it's just it's a little harder because it's sort of a long, it's a long term thing. So I don't know. Other thoughts, comments from other folks? Hey, Aaron Stack. Aaron. Hey, folks. I'd like to thank our presenters for being here. And this has been a really nice presentation. And I'd like to just chime in, you know, real quick uh, with a with a bit on setting your fundraising targets. You know, um, it's it's really really important that you make sure that you set good targets. And, and the way that you're going to do that, how you're going to know how much money you got to raise as you continue through your campaign is by paying attention to what your opposition's up to and what they're doing. So you have to remember you want to be reviewing their financial reports to see how much money they're raising, to see how much money they're spending, to get a better idea of how much money that you need to raise in the next reporting cycle. It's really, really important to, to set accurate fundraising targets and try to keep it on the mark. Because if you get into a dogfight, you're going to need every dollar. And, you know, for those of you who have been on campaigns that have been dog fight, dog fights and you've seen a lot of money spent even in small races, it's really, really critical that you're paying attention to the opposition. Over. So one point that I want to make that I just want to underscore, one of the things that um, Jennifer talked about at the beginning with the, the in-person ask, because, you know, it's not, I, I think this is the first time we've been doing these fundraising webinars for probably five or six years, and I'm... I'm pretty sure this is the first time it's been like explicitly stated, like meet with people in person and ask them for money as opposed to just like email blasts and, you know, Facebook ads and, you know, phone banking, but the in-person thing. I can't tell you how many campaigns I've, wor I've worked on or seen where they just never actually asked you for money. You know, you actually have to ask. You can't just sort of vaguely imply that you have expenses in the presence of people and presume that they're going to whip out their checkbook. You know, like a handful of us, you know, loyal died in the wool greens will do that. But for the most part, people just need to be asked. And so, you know, I can think of a candidate right now who shall remain nameless, who I have coached her and said, you know, make a list like this is kind of like the LinkedIn thing, make a list of 100 people that you know you know, everyone in your cell phone, your babysitter, your banker, your, you know, the person who cuts your hair, your neighbor down the street, your, you know, crazy conservative uncle, whoever, like list all those people and call each single one of them and ask them for money. Ask them for $100. You know, maybe they'll give 20, maybe they'll give nothing, maybe they'll give more. And then you'll have something to start with. And I give this advice. And it's not just, you know, me making this up. Like, this is a known technique of starting with your list of 100 people that you know personally. Candidate doesn't do it and then is months later complaining to me about how they've raised no money. And they've also never actually asked me for money. Um, and so, you know, the, the people just need to sort of put, realize that, like, all these techniques are wonderful and they have to actually be implemented. And the candidate, particularly for those, and high dollar can be whatever you define it as. Like your candidate campaign can take $100 as a high dollar donation, and in many cases it is. However you define that, the candidate has to do a lot of this asking themselves. And I think that's something that candidates, generally speaking, are not prepared or excited about or comfortable doing, and yet it's really the only way to really bring in some serious dollars. Any other comments, thoughts? Uh, this is Chris Richardson again. Um, yeah. I've 
put put a couple of uh, observations in my uh, in the chat. Thank, um, you. Thank you. One of which was uh, I had set up a uh, meet and greet for other uh, Green Party candidates at a local uh, Blaze Pizza, and they have a an outreach program where they will actually supply you with uh, some of some. Um, uh, you know, graphics to to help sell your your uh, attendance, and then they split the purse with you at the end of the evening. It draws people into their business. They get exposure, and we get exposure too. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have as much lead time as we we should have, and uh, so it, it wasn't well attended. But we we did get some money out of it, and. It eventually went to uh, the the person who uh, traveled the farthest. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was it was still a, a a good way of really reaching out to the the, the people. Do you right. know about Blaze Pizza? Um, I don't. I'm. Is this where? What part of the country are you from? Uh, we're in California, but uh, I saw Blaze Pizza in Fairfax. Virginia just last week so it's a chain that's a across the country and they do have this outreach um, which is available and uh, it seems like a, a wonderful way to you know get people into that store and also get you a, a lot of visibility uh, this is Holly uh, yeah we have them I think they're all over if they're in Iowa they've got to be everywhere yeah. else. So, well, yeah, I've never heard of good. them they're, in Philadelphia, but that doesn't mean they don't. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe they're west of the Mississippi. Anyway, they they do have... Well, no, idea. actually, I, I was in, back in Fairfax, Virginia, oh, yes. and they were there. You know, so they're, they're all over the country. Now, right. uh, you know, but please look look them up on the, the web and uh, Blaze Pizza, and uh, they, they're uh, usually local... Uh, you know chains and uh, like a franchise or something yeah, yeah it's a franchise and uh, actually it used to be like uh, Jamba Juice and they mm -hmm. realized that oh their product was uh, a little seasonal and so they went to pizza and turned them into Blaze Pizza got it so Holly you were saying oh I just said uh huh we have Jamba Juice here too yeah <laughs> Apparently yeah. we do have these in Philly, and I just was unaware. But I mean, yeah. one thing I would just caution, and I'm not. I mean, every place is different. There might be some campaign finance implications with any kind of event where you're sort of splitting the take um, with other candidates and or the business themselves. And so I'm not saying that it's not possible to do that on the up and up. You might have to structure it where, you know, at least on the books, like you're paying them. Them, whatever that 50-50 is um, for like the facilities and rental and food as opposed to just like hey we put the product like, like from a, I'm wearing my treasurer hat now like I would be counting 100% of the donations as donations to my campaign and then writing a check to Blaze for sort of you know the oh you don't pay anything to Blaze Blaze, right. well, Blaze saying, is taking right but I'm just saying like from a campaign finance perspective Instead right. of sort of bringing in 500 and you taking home 250 and then taking home 250, you might have to sort of take all the 500 and then write them a check for the 250 and call it like a facilities rental and you know catering fee, just in order to make it be up and up in terms of that sort of thing. But um, but for small stuff like that, I mean honestly, I'm, I'm yeah, it is mostly the visibility that you're shooting yeah. for. Yeah, and it, it's also an outreach to the the small businesses in the the area, you know, and um, and that's another issue, is that uh, single payer health care actually ends up being uh, a big boon to small businesses, you know, so that uh, and needs to be something that that's brought out to to large and small businesses in your area that oh you know if they're single payer then you don't you aren't going to have to deal with the insurance companies any longer 
And that's a, you know, they, the insurance companies are parasites. They're eating on the, the, the profits of these small businesses. Certainly. All right. Well, I'm mindful of the time. It is after the 10 o'clock hour, at least for those of us here on the East Coast. So any okay. final thoughts or comments? And I also no, well, thank you very much. I re really appreciate this. This thank has you. been I very helpful. Great. I definitely want to thank Jennifer and Susan again because um, unlike most of us, this is actually their day jobs. And so being on a call at yeah. 10 o'clock at night. Uh, one one, one last thing. At, so thank you again. Yes. Yeah. At, at, the, at the end of my campaign when I didn't make it, um, I donated the 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 rest of the uh, donations that I had back to the Green Party. Lovely. So there's no question. Thank you. I mean, that's certainly possible. If you have leftover money at the end of your campaign, you can, you know, save it for another run. You can donate it back to the party, like both of those. Um, are yeah. Well, it's it's probably cleaner just to go ahead and donate it and start start afresh. Okay, um, you. you know, it, it just kind of cleans up all the, the financial stuff, and, and my treasurer is going to be a lot happier, too. <laughs> As a treasurer, I certainly understand that. Um, okay, thank right. you very much. Thank you. All right, anybody else, final comments? Aaron or Holly, as co-chairs of the committee, do you want to give us any parting yeah, words um, before we call them tonight? Thank you. I kind of do this for a day job, too, and I was really impressed. It's very, very good, I thought. So thank you. I think this is really helpful. Um, it's a little more in-depth than a lot of our members often get. So thank you very much. I appreciate you doing this. Well, it's been our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you folks for, uh, for coming on. It, it has been a lot of great information. And, you know, I'd like to encourage everyone to, you know, start fundraising, you know, early in your campaign. And, uh, you know, and if you have any questions, you can always contact the CCC, CCC at gp.org. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight. It's a, it's a great call. And thank you, Hillary, for, for, for being a great host. You are quite welcome. Um, just to give people a heads up on some upcoming calls that we will have, um, you know, pending confirmation, but we are aiming for a call on public speaking in a month's time. So I think July 9th is what we were targeting for that. Um, and then we're also going to be having a couple in-person workshops at the annual national meeting in Salem, Massachusetts in late July. So. If you can join us there, that would be awesome. It is a really amazing experience, um, not just because of our CCC workshops, but the whole entire thing, of course, will be great. Um, and yeah, so generally we have these the second Tuesday of the month, sometimes fourth Tuesday, depending on speaker availability. But, um, you know, and there's definitely a lot of great content on our website um, from prior calls. So that's it, and everyone have a fabulous night, and good luck on the campaign trail. I want to hear emails, I want to see stories about the buckets of money everyone is raising after this, after this call. All right, everyone, have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Good Thanks, night. Jennifer and Susan. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.